Welcome to the CFISH webinar on preparing for the new EU customs procedures. Um, and today, obviously, you've probably all seen Kevin speak before, um, but today he's going to talk to us about EU customs. Um, so um, housekeeping, which you're all aware of by now, um, please, can you mute, mute? And also, can you make sure you stay on mute? I think sometimes people go to do something else and take themselves off mute. Uh, Hannah will be guarding the mute button and muting people um, as we go, but it would help if you keep an eye on that. Um, and please, um, if you could use the chat function to ask any questions, um, it's not very easy to see with this many people, it's not very easy to see hands raised. Um, and then we'll try and um, collect the questions and ask the main questions and get back to you with any we can't answer. And also please continue to ask any questions to the regulation at seafish.co.uk inbox if you've got further questions. Um, and just let you be aware, um, you'll be able to see this session is being recorded and will be hosted on YouTube um, after the event for anybody that couldn't make it or if you didn't manage to write down anything as we went along. So I won't waste any more time and I'll pass you over to Kevin. So thank you very much, Kevin, for agreeing to come and do this at short notice today. Thank you very much indeed, Fiona, and it's uh, a pleasure to be able to present to everybody again. Um, I'm conscious that you, you may have heard me speak before and um, there will be some elements of, of what I've said that you'll be familiar with, but hopefully there'll be other elements which will which will invoke discussions uh, uh, today. So if we go through the slides, so the focus here today is Great Britain to European Union, clearly the emphasis on GB because Northern Ireland is subject to, uh, to separate procedures in terms of trade with the European Union. So England, Scotland and Wales to the European Union. So the trade and customs journey, you am sure you've some of you have seen this slide in terms of the requirements for two declarations, an export declaration and an inbound declaration. And it is it is difficult because we hear on the news so much, oh, there's going to be a trade deal, no deal. Uh, but we're leaving aside the fact that, that the trade agreement is predominantly around zero tariffs. Uh, and and you know, we trade on WTO terms. This is all about tariffs to trade deal. We are leaving the customs union and customs declarations will be required. So when it leaves the territory of Great Britain to the European Union and it went, enters the European Union, two sets of declarations are required. And it doesn't change the fact that INCO terms are still responsible for that declaration as to whether that is the GB supplier or the EU buyer. Now, the reason I put this one down, I've started introducing this slide more and more, is that, is that clearly in this sector, you can, well, like any sector, you can, you can use a haulier, a freight forwarder to move the goods, or you can move the goods yourself. Um, if you move your goods yourself, you do have a number of considerations, or your haulier needs, uh, has a number of considerations as well. So from, um, from the 1st of January, there is a requirement to submit both an exit safety and security declaration for leaving Great Britain and an entry safety and security declaration for entering the European Union. So not only do we have two sets of customs declarations, we, have, we now have two safety and security declarations. And the safety and security declaration is a declaration that the goods being carried are safe and secure. And I guess to put it to extreme, that the goods will not cause any harm to people animal, plants, and the environment. So that safety and security declaration is invariably made by the haulier. And uh, in the case of the European Union, it needs to be an entry safety and security declaration, which means that the haulier has to register for the, um, the relative EU system for accessing safety and security declarations. In the UK, the system is known as ICS, the import control system. Um, in the EU, it will be relative to the, uh, the actual country itself. So there needs to be registered for the equivalent safety and security system in the European Union and the country concerned. So if you're moving your own goods, you need to register. When you're moving goods out of Great Britain, if you are using a non-inventory link port, and the main inventory link ports tend to be the major container, global container ports like Felixstowe, Liverpool, Southampton, for example, if you're using non-inventory link, which includes Dover uh, and other smaller ports, you have to register as a haulier for the goods vehicle movement system, GVMS. 
and you have to take declaration you have to take information from declarations both customs and safety and security declarations to populate your GVMS entry including what's called a good uh, an MR, MRN a movement reference number and you need to register for GVMS again if you're carrying a good yourself as well as a haulier carrying them on your behalf and from that goods vehicle movement GVMS register they will obtain a goods movement reference number, a GMR. And that GMR will be needed before the goods allowed to enter the port. So again, that's something else you need to do. And if you are moving through Kent, you might need what's referred to as a Kent passport um, uh, and, uh, and um, uh, arrange for that as well. So clearly uh, the role of hauliers or if you're carrying the goods yourself becomes absolutely key. And, and don't assume just because you've always traded this way with a haulier that it's going to continue. You need, need to communicate to the haulier uh, that this, this information is required. Are there any questions anyone's got on that at all? Hi, Kevin. Yes, there was one in the chat box. Are the same entry and exit declarations required in the reverse, i.e. from the EU into the UK? It's a good question, yeah. So leaving the EU, you need an exit declaration. Under the border operating model in the UK, if we reverse it, for the first six months, an inbound safety and security declaration is not required under the border operating model, but it will be from the 1st of July next year. But you need, I know the French have an equivalent system to GVMS. So if you're the, the haulier who moves the goods or it's yourself would have to register for that French equivalent system. And that's, that's just using France, that's just one country. Great, any other questions at all? Okay. There don't seem to be any more at the moment. Okay, yeah. thank you. So uh, you've probably seen this slide before and it is a variation on, on slides I've used in, in different presentations around the requirement for export health certificates, catch certificates and food labeling requirements. I'm not necessarily going to go into that because we've obviously got other, other experienced colleagues in this regard. Uh, and it doesn't change again that a number of um, uh, uh, goods are required uh, a number of changes of procedures in terms of declarations, wooden packaging. Um, if there is a trade deal between the uh, EU and UK, uh, origin uh, certificates are required, carnets for temporary exports, and the requirements for safety and security declarations. Similarly, on goods that will be imported into the EU, use of traces, goods subject to sanitary and phytosanitary checks, and catch certificates also required doesn't change that and you can see here we're introducing around import VAT which is an area I do want to cover to cover today so um, in terms of inco terms let's really cut to the chase here of of inco terms which again many of you will be familiar with um, uh, and yeah we can replace Scotland there with uh, with uh, GB Great Britain so we still have this situation that X works is maximum responsibility for the European buyer. The European buyer would be responsible for both the export declaration in Great Britain and the, uh, and the inbound declaration in the European Union. They would require a UK, uh, a GB EORI number and a GB VAT number. So they will have to apply to customs. And there will be a credit check obviously undertaken against that organization. Now, it could be, and we are hearing this more and more, that your EU buyers are beginning to push back on this requirement because they're suddenly realizing that they need to get a EORI number and a VAT number, and they are responsible for the declaration, which is not just about the cost of the declaration, it's about the liability. Uh, uh, of, the, of the, dial, uh, the declaration to HMRC in the UK. So if that's the case, they would move to FCA free carrier. And then the responsibility for the declaration falls on the GB supplier. So suddenly the GB supplier may be thinking, well, I've not got to do anything. And suddenly they have 15, 16 days to make arrangements to make declarations. So then they have to think, well, if it's FCA, 
the, G, uh, the EU bio is arranging all the haulage, it's their lorry, do I go to their freight forward or a haulage firm and say, please, can you do this on my, my behalf? What is the charge for doing this? The average cost of a decoration is around £30.80, 80, 80 pence. but for smaller volumes, clearly the charge may be higher. As we've seen, the agent uh, or freight forwarder making the decoration may have to do a safety and security and credit check on yourselves to make sure the goods are, are uh, safe and secure. Um, so again, that can take time as well. So anyone who is currently um, currently selling on XWorks needs to be very clear that they will be able to continue on XWorks. And they're not left scrambling around trying to find somebody to make the decoration for them. Then we clearly have to reverse in terms of DDP versus DAP. And we know clearly that DAP delivered at place is far better for the EU, uh, for the GB supplier in that the declaration in the European Union is made by the EU buyer. They are also responsible for the uh, import duty, if there is any, and the import fat. Uh, but um, uh, uh, again, we're very appreciative of the fact that some uh, some buyers in the EU may be very small organisations, hotel chains, market traders, restaurants and other small providers that you may be concerned about their ability to make declarations. Also, some EU buyers may say, well, I'm sorry, you've got to deliver on the same terms as today, which means you're going to have to use deliver duty paid. So you would then need an EU Riori number and an EU VAT number. You would need an EU Riori number to make the declaration in the European Union. We, we got a slide later on just to clarify around Riori numbers. It's one of the final slides. But you would need that EU Riori number. So uh, again, we've got it. In fact, I'm going to I'm going to literally go forward to the bottom slide, but then come back on on Iori, Oh, sorry, this slide on Iori numbers. So currently, you have one Iori number for trading with the European Union during the transition period. You could have two or three EORI numbers from the 1st of January. Your GB EORI number applies to GB only, and you will require that uh, an EORI number to make declarations um, from GB, even if you are not VAT registered as well. So, so VAT and non-registered, non-VAT registered businesses. So that you would need that, but that is for GB only. If you are responsibility for the declaration in the EU, you will require an EU Riori number, which it will be separate. If you are making declarations in Northern Ireland, and we had a previous webinar in Northern Ireland, you will require an XE Eori number, which will be the same number as your GB number, but prefixed, uh, sorry, XE, prefixed XI Eori number. We would stress again that Iori numbers are based on the INCO terms used. So again, uh, obtaining an Iori number, how do I do that? I get it from a, a one customs authority in the EU. In reality, a lot of businesses have been going to the Netherlands or, or Ireland. There was a delay we heard with German uh, customs issuing Iori numbers, but we understand that uh, Germany has agreed to issue them before the 1st of January. Previously, Germany was saying they couldn't issue them before the 1st of January. But uh, Netherlands and Ireland tend to be the most too popular, especially the Netherlands. Um, but a VAT number is different. If you've got to pay import VAT, you've got to pay import VAT in the EU upon importation, which links into our next slide. So VAT is payable upon importation to the EU, but how can I avoid paying VAT upon importation? Well, I can try and get the goods to enter a state that has postponed VAT accounting. The Netherlands, again, is the one that's always referred to. Belgium did, have, or, did or has postponed VAT accounting, but following some misuse and some potential fraud uh, and unpaid liabilities, it's now more a registration process. I must stress that has been from companies in uh, businesses in Asia uh, moving goods to the rest of the world to Belgium that has caused concerns there and the tax authorities in Belgium have become more, more robust and rigid as to who they allow to, uh, the, uh, the relaxations to postpone VAT to apply. France allegedly or supposedly has uh, relaxed its postponed import VAT. 
The reality is, and I know some of you have mentioned this before, that the French authorities are, uh, are not issuing VAT numbers, more about VAT numbers and fiscal representation shortly. They're not issuing VAT numbers. They are requesting that import VAT is payable immediately upon importation. So there's cash flow impact. Yes, you can try and claim it back from the authorities, uh, but they're... Um, uh, the, the, the element there of um, uh, having to pay the VAT up front um, has that cash flow impact on businesses. And I've also called out the Czech Republic, which has long been used by businesses in the rest of the world uh, to, um, uh, to uh, 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 arrange VAT. So that's an example of postponed VAT. You could try and establish a VAT deferment account with the customs authorities in the country. But in some countries, that would require fiscal representation. We'll look at the countries shortly. Your freight forward or your customs agent may agree to pay the VAT on their deferment account. But that will obviously cost you. Uh, but it is a, 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 a effectively a potential route. But the more and more companies that request that, the harder it's going to become for the uh, freight forward or customs agent to take that as their own VAT liabilities will increase dramatically as well. So that and DDP uh, becomes hugely important. And the next slide details the countries where uh, that require fiscal representation. We should also note here that some countries are optional, Germany being an example of one being optional, which is a bit confusing as to, well, is it or isn't it? It's optional. Now, clearly, if the VAT liabilities continue to increase and GB businesses do not pay their VAT on time, then, uh, then I guess the EU authorities could, uh, could change their mind. In a similar way, Netherlands could change its mind if there is an increase in unpaid liability. That remains to be seen. This slide is taken from Europa EU in terms of the required for fiscal representative. And also with fiscal representatives, sometimes fiscal reps will require a, a, a bank guarantee or some form of liability, holding them free from any liability that you have. So we can see here a big issue already around VAT and the ability to defer that, that if you can. And we hear it in France, obviously, in some cases that the French authorities are, are not issuing VAT numbers and they want payment to the import VAT immediately to avoid future liabilities. Um, just a point there, and I had to slide in, but I think I took it out, was around transit procedures. So if you are moving goods through France, and technically you can move it under transit. However, obviously for fisheries products, it could be subject to SBS checks, uh, which clearly defeats the object in some respects of moving goods under transit. Happy to take questions on transit. Now, at this stage, I want to talk about EU virtual offices, and this is not just for, um, for VAT purposes. It could be for duty payments. So suddenly, if there is no trade deal, we're talking about import duties as well, not just import VAT. And again, the authorities in the EU could take a, an interesting view on that. If import duty is due on my, uh, due on my goods, will the, uh, will the authorities require their import duty to, uh, to be paid up front, will they accept some form of deferment? Um, will it require a duty deferment account as it currently does in, 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 uh, in the UK? Or, or will the freight forwarder be prepared to pay the duty on their own duty deferment account? Again, subject to increase in liabilities if they do that. And sometimes an EU virtual office may be required for a warehouse facility or uh, compliance certification. The reason I've called it virtual office is, well, what do we mean by virtual office? Really interesting question. Yeah, what do we mean? So what is the difference between a virtual office and a legal entity? A legal entity requires a properly registered company in the EU country. It should also require a bank account as well. A virtual office, sometimes referred to as a brass plate, doesn't necessarily require the same legal entity status. But then this poses the question, well, are virtual offices allowed? And if you speak to law firms, I would say they're split 50-50. Some say, yeah, of course you can have a virtual office, no problem. 
and they might be trying to sell their services in that regard. Others might say, no, that's not allowed. Uh, all I would say that is you are, if you are using somebody to help you set up a virtual office, you should be clear in terms of what is allowed and it was not allowed and make sure you're using the services of an organization who is experienced in these areas. The EU have come out and said they have concerns around virtual offices being used for money laundering uh, and, and, uh, and smuggling and various types of goods. That doesn't mean technically you can't use virtual offices. And I'm very aware that some EU countries are, are uh, let's say, proposing virtual offices. If you go back to March this year, two EU countries in particular, although the level of advertising on this has, has suddenly declined uh, around, uh, I'll help you set up a virtual office in the EU. So it, all I would say at the moment is if you, if you do have a virtual office, if, it's, if virtual offices are used by organizations for incorrect or illegal purposes, there could be a clampdown on the use of them, as some countries around the world have banned virtual offices and they're insisting on legal entities and bank accounts and proper registration. That's not to say virtual offices can't be used, uh, and I'm conscious there are some firms still advertising the services, but I just wanted to bring out the fact that even if they can be used today, doesn't necessarily mean that they'll be uh, they'll be available in the future if they're used for the incorrect purposes. And I think the EU are watching this situation quite closely. So at this stage, I think I'm going to open it up for further questions uh, in terms of anything on INCO terms, VAT, <coughs> virtual offices, bank accounts that anybody's got. Um, Kevin, yes, there are a couple of questions that came in. Um, you said you'd take questions on transit as well and this is one to do with transit. Um, do you need to present documents in each country that do the goods pass through in Europe on their way to their destination? Yeah, so the, 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 if you like, the pure, the operation of transit is that you, is that you have a, um, an office of uh, departure, which is approved. So in the most cases, that would be freight forwarders and hauliers that would be approved for transit, not the trader themselves. You can get approved as a trader, but you will require a bank guarantee and your premises will be subject to inspection. So you would need an approved office of departure known as known consignor or approved consignor. And you would need an office of arrival known as approved consignee or known consignee. And your office's arrivals uh, must be inspected by the customs authorities, which is why it tends to be freight forwarders and hoarders moving goods, obviously not just moving one company's goods, but moving several organizations' goods as part of a transit procedure. So a classical example we refer to could be goods moving from Dover to Calais through France to, to Belgium to Germany, for example. In that sort of example, you would only, um, the, the effectively, what you have is you have a transit accompanying document, TAD, which goes with the journey. So if anyone asks to see the TAD, uh, the, the, the driver can approve it. But technically, technically the main documents are, are in using our example in GB and Germany. But the transit accompanying document is with the journey at all times in case anybody wants to see it. Um, Kevin, so if you're exporting seafood from from the UK um, to somewhere else and it's transiting across Europe, so would the office of departure be in the UK or would it be, for example, France at the point at which it enters Europe? It would be it would be UK Great Britain. That would be the office of departure at an approved customs premises. I'll move on to the next question then. Um, I hope you understand it because I didn't quite understand it. How is the export entry arrived at? Pr uh, sorry, how is the export entry arrived at premises to get P2P, which I think is permission to progress? Yeah. So what would happen in terms of the export entry is, is that if we use an example, let's well probably is the example Great Britain to the European Union. We need an export declaration. So you have a couple of choices as a business in terms of that export declaration. You can use the services of a freight forwarder or a customs agent to make the declaration on your behalf. If you were to do that, you would instruct them to make the declaration. So you have to instruct them to make that declaration. 
you would normally have to give them in essential information to enable the declaration, such as a commercial invoice, possibly a packing list as well. Um, so um, if you did that, they would make the declaration on your behalf. Uh, if you did it yourself, you can, you can go in yourself to make the declaration. You would have to yourself, you would have to purchase what's called software to interface to, uh, to, to the, uh, the, the current UK declaration system, which is called Chief Customs Handling of Import and Export Freight. So you would have to purchase software if you did it yourself. You would also have to purchase what we call badges, port badges for goods to move. So Dover, Portsmouth, Southampton, et cetera. So you would have to purchase those badges, which is, a, which is an annual cost uh, to purchase those badges. So you can do it yourself and there are grants available and um, um, a, a number of companies that are doing that themselves, but equally a number are using freight forwarders and agents. So once you input into the uh, software system, it then uh, effectively uh, it, uh, links into what we call community software providers, which is the, uh, uh, the, the organizations that have the badges for the various ports of departure. Uh, and assuming a declaration is correct, you will get a PTP permission to proceed. You need that because you need, uh, you need the references, um, uh, again, to populate your GVMS, your goods vehicle movement system uh, reference as well. So you need, uh, before the goods arrive at the port, you need that. You need the um, safety and security declaration information as well which is why it's important. But so you, you, can, you can outsource it to an agent, a, a, uh, a freight forwarder who, if, if they do it, who carrying the goods for you, obviously for a fee, or you could do it yourself. If you are gonna do it yourself, there are elements you need to consider. A, uh, a you need to understand what you're doing clearly. You need to purchase the software and the, and the badges. Um, and, and there has to be an, a benefit such as time criticality, for example, customer service as to why you would do it yourself. I mean, some businesses do it themselves, having said that. So that, if you like, gets you the permission, the PTP, the permission to uh, proceed. So thanks, Kevin. Here's one on import VAT. Is import VAT due on fishery products? Um, oh, I'm going to need to check that. And in the UK, we have postponed VAT accounting. Um, I'll need to check that. I, I, it, it, do you know yourself? I, I must have actually looked at that import VAT payable. I presume it is, but I, I can check. I, I, I presume it is. In yeah. Europe, I, I presume it will be. Yeah, I, I can't see why not. Now, VAT, sometimes you get lower rates of VAT for certain types of products or zero like medical products, like, like um, baby, baby foods, baby clothing, things like that, uh, toys. Uh, I, I presume it's payable, but it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fair question, I guess, which we can go away and check, but I would assume VAT would be payable. As, assuming it's not payable, with the whole transaction, you, there still are VAT bills to, to complete on there. If it's zero, if, if the product is zero rated for VAT, then there wouldn't be any VAT payable. Would you have to pay for the transport and all the extra services? Though? Yeah, you still have to pay, uh, obviously, for the transport. You still have duties if there's no trade deal. So you, you, you've, still got, you've still got those elements that, uh, that are due there. But I'm pretty sure VAT is payable because when we had the trader support service call on Northern Ireland, we had a number of, I presume, the same participants on this call were very much saying around the import VAT element in France. Right, so thanks, Kevin. Here's a question on tuna that's kept in bond in France. So we keep super frozen yellowfin and albacore tuna in bond in a cold store in France. Bring it over, we need to bring it over from bond to clear in the UK two or three times a week. And we would do this on a T1 document with a CHED P extract. That's the health certificate type thing. But I'm being told that a storage document is required. The problem is 
there is no template that I'm aware of. Could you tell me what is meant by a storage document and where I can find an example of this? So and I think I know the answer to this, Kevin, if you don't. No, you go on then, Ivan. Fine. Yeah. Yeah, there, there isn't um, in, in the legislation, in European legislation, in UK legislation, there isn't a template, you're right, of the storage document. Um, there is, there are a number of things that have to go into the storage document. If you go to the MMO's website and try to make your own storage document certificate, which I have done myself, it, you will come up with a template and that'll give you a good idea of what the storage document should look like. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, I can send you all the details on what a storage document should look like. So Tony Baines, it's regulation at seafish.co.uk. Um, anything you want to add, Kevin, or is that it? No, I think that's sort of, sort of covered it. I, I would say, I mean, we haven't talked about bond to bond in terms of bonded warehouse and customs warehouse here. That, 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 that in, I, I guess in the nature of this industry with, with perishability, that becomes harder. But if there are any types of goods that are not perishable, it is possible to actually move them in, 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 into a customs warehouse and happy to talk about that if there are any questions there. So the next question is, we land our fish directly to the EU fish market. Do we need the EORI number for the fish auction and what else? We know that the catch certificates are required. Yeah, so I guess in terms of the first part of the question, if you are exporting goods or fish, you will require export declarations, both leaving Great Britain and entering the European Union. That doesn't change irrespective of, 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 of the nature of the goods. The interesting challenge you've got to think about there is who is the buyer? Who is the consignee for the goods? Is it a market trader? Is it, is, it, is it some form of distributor? Who is the consignee? And that then influences um, the, uh, the INCO terms, the international commercial terms, the trading terms used um, as to whether you have to take responsibility to that because of the, let's say, the small and, and the, the less, uh, less trade awareness uh, on the part of the EU buyer. So those are a number of considerations. But every movement has to have a consignor and a consignee where the goods are arriving. So you still have to declare a consignee, which would be the organizational party receiving the goods. But you still need declarations, absolutely. And you will still, again, I stand corrected, you will require other elements as you would for any movement, export health certificates, catch certificates, etc. Thanks, Kevin. Here's one about splitting consignments once it gets to France. So we export to France as one consignment to Boulogne. From there, we split the consignment and allocate to transport company depots chosen by multiple customers. The customers then arrange transport to their own countries, Belgium, Spain, and so on. Can we obtain a VAT and EORI number in France for the consignment and then produce a sales invoice for customers in each country from our GB office? Oh, that's a really, really good question. So first of all, what you're talking about there is you're talking about one, one export transaction and then you're talking about different invoices to, um, to the parties. It's a really, really good question. Now, technically, for every export transaction, you are open to you are open to audit from either the customs authorities or the VAT authorities. So, uh, with the EU, you would zero rate your exports to the EU, zero rate for for VAT purposes, which is why import VAT is payable upon importation, and you would need customs declarations. And depending on the INCO terms, you clearly may, uh, if it's DDP deliver duty paid, you would be responsible for VAT duty and having an EU EORI number. Now, with regard to the invoicing procedures, it's quite an interesting question because ultimately when customs come in, 
they would expect to see one commercial invoice match to one export transaction. So they would pick out an export transaction and say, can you show me your proof of export file, which would require commercial invoice, packing list, quotations, uh, um, transport documents, and the PTP export uh, permission to proceed evidence of export as well. So when you pull out your commercial invoice and it says different amounts, obviously that could raise some questions from the authorities there. So uh, it, it really does depend how, how the authorities view that type of transaction. They could say, right, you've made a, you've, you've explained that, fine, I understand totally, all these commercial invoices make up this uh, shipment, that's absolutely fine. Or they could turn around and say, no, actually, you, your commercial invoice does not match, uh, let's, let's have a further discussion. It probably does depend on the authorities as to how they view that type of transaction. In theory, probably what you should do and do it, you should do, and it's going to be difficult in the limited time, and we know customs and VAT authorities are very busy at the moment, is raise the questions of the authorities and how they would review that. So at least you can say you've raised that question in advance, you try to sort guidance on it as to whether it's allowed. Obviously, the, the reverse purpose there is that you would have to issue the invoices from the European Union itself. Now, some of you may have already raised the questions of the authorities. Some of you may have sought legal advice on this. I'm very, very interested to hear what feedback you've got as to, as to what the authorities are saying. If anyone has feedback, uh, please, please put it in the chat facility and, and let Ivan and, and, and Hannah and Fiona know, because I'd be very interested in that. But I would say the safest thing, if you haven't done so, is to check with the authorities as to what as to what view they would take on that type of transaction. OK, so ERA your, your numbers we've covered. So custom special procedures. And we talk about this more in imports into the UK, but it can also apply to exports as well. The basic principle is clearly from the 1st of January next year, goods movements to the EU, including the Republic of Ireland, become imports and exports. Currently, there's arrivals and dispatches. So some of the classical custom special procedures we haven't needed to think about unless we're trading with the rest of the world currently. So customs warehouse is where you hold goods in a customs warehouse and you don't pay any import duty or import that until it's released from the warehouse into free circulation. So the example I've used often, um, is, which may or may, may not be appropriate, is you're bringing goods in from China and Thailand, and then you're, re, um, you're bringing them into free circulation. So you're not paying the import duty or that straight away. But if you were to re-export them, so we'll keep with the China and Thailand uh, route very quickly. If you were to re-export them to EU, including uh, Southern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, you do not pay import duty and import that upon re-export. It's exactly the same if you're bringing goods in, say, from Spain, from France, and you're re-exporting them to Ireland or back to the EU. So you would then be able to um, uh, uh, not pay import duty or VAT upon re-export. But you need to apply for custom special procedure. It's not just given to you, it's an application process. You have inward processing if goods, if goods come into some form of production process, which can include ingredients as well, which is very similar in its operation. You have temporary admission if you're bringing goods in to carry out a piece of work or a piece of equipment uh, as well, which can apply for two years. Now, um, to become authorised, uh, traditionally it's taken around four months to become authorised, but the main reason for that is in the UK you require financial guarantees. So, uh, but um, from the 1st of January next year, you will not require a financial guarantee for customs warehousing, for even duty deferment in the UK, duty deferment accounts, unless you're a high risk trader. So with a history of non-compliance penalties or, or you're not deemed financially solvent. So uh, equally, the reverse can operate. You can, you can export goods to the European Union, bring them back to the UK, and that would apply for this. But the application in that case has to be made to the EU customs authorities, not the UK, and you will require a financial guarantee in that instance. So that's procedures, very happy to take questions on that. 
um, as to the use, but you have to be approved by customs and it is a bit like an audit. When customs come in and audit you or audit you virtually, they will ask to see your transactions or evidence of record keeping and compliance. Okay, so happy to continue with the questions, thank you. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Gavin. Um, I can't see any questions specifically on uh, on special procedures just yet. I suspect people are just taking a bit long, like a bit of time to type. Can we go back to some of the earlier ones that we missed? Yeah, of course. Um, there's there's uh, live bivalve shellfish uh, with live bivalve shellfish which will require an inspection at the approved border control post in Europe. How, when will this happen? And have any BCPs been agreed yet, yet for bivalves? This might be one for Hannah. Yeah, I've actually just responded to that one oh, at the bottom sorry. of the chat, Ivan. Okay, thanks. Um, here's another one. When we bring product from our super frozen cold store this carries on from the earlier one i think we need to raise a commercial invoice which we do for customs purposes as we are both the exporter and the importer we are planning to raise an invoice for clearing purposes from and to the same company is this okay so for for the purposes of customs audit traditionally around the world Evidence of the evidence of invoicing is required to check a number of things, including the devaluation of the goods for customs purposes, and there is a valid transaction. So it is okay to raise a, a, a commercial invoice. Uh, clearly, you, you you should note the movement that it's that it's into company, um, and and whether it's if you like for internal bookkeeping. But technically, a commercial invoice is good practice. Yes. Thanks, Kevin. I. I personally get a lot of questions from people about invoicing, especially people that are dealing with goods arriving in one part of Europe and going to another part of Europe. And yet they're a company based in the UK and would like to invoice from the UK. So, so can that usually be done? So Ivan, let's just work this through here. So let's check my understanding is correct of this. So if goods are moving within the European Union, and but the invoice is from the UK. Is that the question? That is the question. Yeah. Yeah. Th this is a really interesting one. We're getting a lot of questions on this at the moment, and and it's easy for me to say, well, this is down to the authorities what they do because it <laughs> is. Now, technically, um, it's more likely to be picked up by the VAT authorities and the customs authorities because there is no customs declaration. Now, the VAT authorities could come in and say you've zero rated that for VAT, where's your proof of export file? And you'll say, well, there isn't any proof of export, I'm afraid. Technically, the penalty for that could be you have to pay the VAT and obviously subject to fines as well. And then they'd look back for a number of transactions. The question is, is will customs authorities accept that? Uh, sorry, will VAT authorities accept that? And it's a question, I guess, that what we would say, and again, you appreciate you may have taken legal advice on this, and if you have, I'd be delighted to hear what legal advice you're getting, because it does differ from some law firms. Um, it, it, technically, you should liaise with the VAT authorities as to whether they consider that acceptable. It could be if you give an explanation, and it's all about board, and you're not trying to deceive in any way uh, through VAT or payment, that it will be accepted. But it may depend on the VAT inspector at the time. Now, appreciate you may have had legal advice and again, very happy to take that, but it's a really, really difficult question as to weigh the authorities. Now, banks could become interested. The question is how on earth will banks know because you'll have money coming from the EU abroad into the UK, but you don't have a UK movement. And for KYC and anti-money laundering, banks should have evidence of an export transaction. Now, banks don't, the argument is, will banks ever spot this? Are they more interested in Iran and Syria than, than cross-trading and, 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 and trying to deceive the authorities? But it is worth it that the bank could take an interest as well. It's worth mentioning that. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Um, 
another question here. I don't know if you can respond, but I'll try. We are struggling to find a customs agent to work uh, to work with on the 1st of January. Are there any known customs agents which will complete the customs declarations for us, even though we carry and transport our own goods on the 1st of January? Yeah, uh, again, coming back to the fact you're carrying and transporting your own goods, everything I've said before around safety, security checks, GVMS and the Kemp passport, if it's applicable to the route, all come into play. So you have to be aware of that. And also not just the UK systems, but the EU systems as well. So the equivalent of GVMS in France, using that as an example. So you need to be need to be aware of that. Now, with regard to customs, on gov.uk, there is a list of customs brokers, um, and it is a long, long list. Now, it's easy for me to trawl out that list, and that's a stock answer. The reality sometimes is some customs brokers are, let's say, wary of taking on new clients they're not aware, uh, they're not aware of. Equally, the number of new organizations coming into this market, and I'll be careful what I say as it being regulated or unregulated, probably fair to say it's unregulated, you need to be careful about the customs broker you're using. So uh, there are some very experienced ones and some very, very good ones, but there's a lot of new ones out there. The last thing you want is the customs broker making an error and saying, well, it's your problem because it is your problem. You're still liable. Uh, so you need to be careful, even if you're rushing around to find someone, that you do your due diligence on them. How long have they been around? How experienced are the people making the declarations? What software, what badges? Do they have access to Portsmouth, to Dover, to Pool, et cetera? Uh, Imminem, uh, Hull. You need to really check that. Uh, and not just go for the first customs broker out there because the list of customs brokers is increasing all the time. There clearly are some very good ones out there, but there's some new ones as well. So, but you can go to gov.uk, but you need to do your due diligence. And I appreciate it is difficult. Thanks, Kevin. There's uh, one more question from Michael about being registered with the local VAT authorities uh in in the country where you're dealing with that you're dealing who's dealing with the customs M michael do you want to come online and pose that question yourself yeah hi hi, hi. uh yeah what it, what it is kevin uh sorry i'm a qualified accountant as it happens as well uh, basically where you where you want about the questions about uh, do they have to register for vat and everything it depends, you know, doing an invoice from the UK and then mail to sell in France or wherever. It depends on what country they're selling in uh, because every European country has a different VAT registration limit. Mm -hmm. And basically, if they're some, some are zero, where you've got to be registered in that country to make any sales. Some are, like in this country, it's 85,000 pounds and above where you'd be mandatory to have to register. So really, it depends on what country you're selling in as to whether you have to register or not. Also, what you need to be conscious of, in some countries, you've got to have a fiscal representative as well in that country to do your VAT returns. The best place for people to look on individual circumstances is look at, and you've already mentioned them, Alve if you go on Alvira's website, that tends to list all the countries and it tells you whether you need to be VAT registered in that country to trade in that country or not in the EU, because there is no hard and fast rule about it. No, thanks, Michael. That's really, really, really helpful. Thanks very much. Thank you in, in that regard. Yeah. 